Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamblett, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Friday, September 27th, almost to the end of the month. Good to have you on board, everyone. Today's episode is brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. All right, joining me today is one of my favorite proceedings authors, Naval War College Professor Jim Holmes. His most recent piece in our magazine in proceedings is a commentary we published on Monday. It's an online-only piece, so if you've got the uh, print magazine at home, you won't find it. It is online only, and it is titled, The Navy's New NAV Plan Sets Its Sights on China from a Sea Denial Stance. Jim, welcome to the show. How are things in Newport? Hey, Bill. Uh, pretty, pretty good. We, uh, we had some we had some weather last night, but uh, the things, things are looking pretty good at, uh, out on, uh, across the Narragansett Bay today. We, I like it. Yeah, better than in uh, Northwest Florida, I guess, today, right? Yeah, my uh, my mom and a lot of my friends from growing up. I, I grew up in Pensacola, and they 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 dodged a bullet last night. I think I, I believe the storm uh, swung more towards Apalachicola or perhaps even Tallahassee. So it was not a it was not a Pensacola mobile thing. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, I've got a, a good buddy who lives in Pensacola as well, and he said uh, it was it it landed well to the east of them, so not so bad there. But yeah, that I think Tallahassee got flooded. So yeah, there's a, they were they were talking about it, uh, it something like a fifteen to twenty foot storm surge, which is huge on the Gulf Coast. It was uh, yikes. <laughs> yeah. So when uh, when CNO Franchetti, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Franchetti, released her NAV plan a week and a half ago, I reached out to ask you to give us your initial take on it. Um, and you were there, I guess. She spoke up at the Naval War College when she unveiled or you know rolled out the NAV plan. You know, what were some of your first impressions? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah, she. Yeah, she. She came up with her here with her entourage and uh, it, basically the entire student body, the faculty, and the staff. But we were either uh, there was a select group in through its auditorium seats about six hundred people. So there were six hundred people in the auditorium between guests and between War College people, and then the rest of us uh, watched on Zoom. I, which is what I did. Which is what I did. But uh, I, I liked it. I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was very good. Uh, it reminds us that China is the next big thing, which is. I think has been pretty clear, pretty clear for quite some time, even under pre previous leadership. So I don't think that was a radical departure, but front loading it. I mean, she she starts off the navigation plan by calling out uh, not not Xi Jinping by name, but she talks about the the, the Chinese Communist Party secretary and, and his people, and, uh, and and basically puts us on notice that this is the next big thing, and that's what we have to get used used to. And she puts us on a deadline. I mean, she's she's talking about Xi Jinping has been has been talking about the. Not necessarily just automatically giving the order the way some people in Washington think about uh, 2027, but he has certainly directed the People's Liberation Army, Navy, and also supporting uh, joint forces, maritime militia, and so forth. He has told them to be ready to go in 2027 so that he has that option should he choose to exercise it. So I think so. I think uh, blunt talk is good. I think the, I think uh, setting a deadline is good. I also, one other thing that I also that I also liked was, and, and you know, I don't remember seeing it in previous navigation plans or other documents. Like she is, she actually situates herself as in, in the history of naval leadership. I mean, she talks she talks about uh, what she inherited from CNO Gilday, her, her predecessor, and she also and she also vows. She, I mean, she vows to leave the navy. Uh, in a in a better place than she found it uh, to her successor. So she calls her she calls her navigation plan plan thirty three, which she, she being in the uh, 33rd uh, uh, chief of naval operations, and she wants to leave it to uh, in four years to to a number thirty four better. Uh, the uh, the one thing is, so I so I like the document very much, and uh, she what's what she's trying to do is necessary, but it's she's trying to she's basically trying to force a needed paradigm shift on the on the uh, service. I mean, when we look around ourselves and look at the strategic and operational environment, we, we tend we tend to think, okay, things things are changing around around us. China is rising. China and Russia have, have declared a, a partnership, and so forth. We tend we tend to think that we sort of revise our estimates of the situation, our practice is what we do, and our force structure as the world changes around us. It's sort of in an orderly way. But uh, I did a companion piece on this over at the National Interest, and I talked about the I talked about the concept of a paradigm shift. Uh, Thomas Kuhn, who was a professor at MIT in the 50s and 60s, wrote a wrote a, a, a vastly influential book about scientific revolutions, in which he in which he posited he maintains that communities are are guided; they have entrenched ideas that dominate how they how they think, what they feel about what the environment around them, and what they do. 
that constitutes the reigning paradigm. And it's written into it in, the, in, a, in a bureaucratic institution like the United States Navy. That paradigm is written into doctrine and it, it mass, manifests itself in fleet design and operations. And Navy people are that they're rewarded for furthering the paradigm, buying into it. In our case, offensive sea control. That's what we've been doing ever since the days of, of the days of Mahan. And they're and they're and they're discouraged, if not uh, punished, for for deviating from that. So the tendency, I mean, this is a political process when you talk about actually revising or, or do, doing away with a paradigm, simply because uh, the paradigm attracts defenders, and it, it uh, oftentimes takes a really uh, traumatic event like a Pearl Harbor or maybe a September 11th to, to shatter that paradigm, to show that it's out of step with reality, and to compel the institution, institution to update its ways in order to fit the times and the, uh, and the circumstances. So. But in a real in a real sense, uh, Admiral Franchetti is trying to break or at least amend our paradigm of sea power and put it to, and, and put in place one that's better uh, suited for, for realities in the Western Pacific. And, and yeah, and, and Jim, your point there is that the Navy's got to and and she's trying to shift it from thinking about itself in terms of uh, sort of automatic and and always geared towards sea control towards gearing itself towards sea denial, right? Yeah. And as you as you point out in the article. A sea denial strategy has has historically tended to be a strategy for the the weaker side in naval warfare, right? It's like okay, so if you've got if you're the stronger uh, the stronger foe, the stronger um, you know combatant, then you you know can go forth on the sea. You you can um, you can control the seas. You've got a, enough force, enough firepower, enough know how uh, that you can control the sea lines, right? But if you're the weaker side, then you're you're doing everything you can to, um, you know, attack and withdraw, um, weaken the other, weaken the sea control of the other guy, deny the other guy, the adversary, the opportunity to control the sea. You know, inherent in in the the CNO's nav plan is the fact that in a 2027 Taiwan scenario, which is a uh, it, definitely a home game for the Chinese and definitely an extreme away game for the United States. The United States is at least at the start going to be in, in sea denial mode, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the way to think about it, well, I mean, it, it, sea denial, it sort of depends on who the, who the contestant is. For, for a big ocean going power like the United States, so sea denial is a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a temporary thing if we do it right. The, the for our listeners, if you, if you want to start getting in the Admiral Frank Kitty frame of mind about uh, about playing defense, the, the place to look is uh, uh, Julian Corbett's book, uh, Some Principles of Maritime Strategy, which you can find out there in full text online. Don't, don't need to spend any money on it. But just read what he says about active, about active defense. It's about, I mean, if you're the weaker power at a particular place in time, as we will be on day one of a conflict, I think there's no question about that since we're talking about a fraction of our joint force going up against the, the combined might of the People's Liberation Army on their own ground. I mean, even if all our allies join in, which I, which I suspect they will, we, I think we're still going to be outmatched until we can actually uh, muster all of our combat power in the Western Pacific to fight. So what you do is you look for you look for efforts to like like you said deny control of the sea while you're while at the same time you are making yourself stronger. Whether it's getting your allies together, whether it's uh, building new shipping, amassing whatever you have on the scene, and, and so forth. So it's a, so it's a very active way of def, of, de, of denying your adversary control of the sea until such time you weaken him enough. And made yourself strong enough that you've that you've crossed over, you've reached a crossover point, and are now stronger. And at that point, you can start transitioning to the offense. So, see that. So when you when you hear about sea denial, it, it can be a very passive thing. It can be when you're a, when you're a big navy such as our own, you're talking about a temporary thing that you do while you have to until you can do other things. Ultimately, you do end up uh, if if you do it correctly, going for the big Mahaney and uh, the big Mahaney and victory that gives you sea command or maritime command. So command of the sea, as he calls it. So that's that's the way to think of the, the way to think about it. It's something that you it's a temporary expedient until you can actually win. Yeah, um, you also harken back to uh, Admiral Harry Arnell a uh, hundred years ago or so, and when he was a captain um, in discussions about strategy post World War One, he questioned whether you needed to have an enemy in order to have a strategy. Right, uh, pulled out a, a historical analogy there. Uh, when you when you read and heard um, Cino Franchetti's uh, nav plan, basically saying, you know, you, you said you started off with a, a cheery huzzah uh, from from the ghost of Harry Arnell because 
uh, he would have approved of this new NAV plan in naming an adversary. So talk about that a little bit. And I, I want to get with, a, I've got a follow-on question for you about sort of where the Navy is now. And I'm wondering if the past 30 years of not really having um, a, an adversary at sea has caused the malaise that the Navy has found itself in, in the you know late 2010s and early 2020s. Yeah, I guess sort of the three points. Uh, for, first of all, for, for people who hadn't read the piece, I, I started off with uh, it, this was that uh, Yarnell quotation comes from uh, 19, 1919 when he was, was indeed a captain serving on the op nav staff. I, I think I think they did call it the op nav staff even back then. But uh, but it, the, what the Navy was doing back then was somewhat like well, like what we're doing now. They were coming out of World War One. They were the Navy was looking around and trying to figure out what the next big thing was. Ultimately, ultimately of course, they decided on Imperial Japan, just as Imperial Japan had decided uh, on on us as the, as the next big thing by uh, 1907 or thereabouts. So this was. World War II in the Pacific was a long time in the making, but uh, Yarnell, Yarnell says Yarnell says that uh, trying to trying to design a force without an antagonist in view or without a war plan to vanquish that antagonist is like trying to design a machine tool without knowing whether it is going to manufacture hairpins or locomotives. You have to have some sort of tan some sort of tangible measuring stick uh, for your fleet design, for your operation strategy, all that kind of stuff. Otherwise, you end up otherwise you end up doing what we did after the Cold War, which is uh, which is going over to things like capabilities based planning, which 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 are sort of you know sort of wishes that that, that we're going to build the right capability, but we're, we're really not going to measure it against anybody. I mean that that obscures the reality that that you procure forces and and, and figure out how to use them. To compete against real and tangible adversaries, I mean that's it's, it's, you almost have to. So you almost have to have to agree with Yar now. China, China certainly does. I mean, secondly, China certainly agrees with Harry Yar now. We we have been the designated opponent for at least the last thirty years, arguably arguably even more since uh, Desert since Desert Storm when uh, China realized that. Uh, that we had just, that we had just uh, whooped up on a, a Soviet equipped military, not unlike the People's Liberation Army, and resolved and resolved to to, to, to never let that happen to to China. The uh, third point is, is sort of one of my standard talking points. It, it's 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 even worse than you than, than you made it. You, you pointed out that we, that we that we haven't had an adversary. We've been doing uh, you know supported counterinsurgencies and whatnot uh, for the last thirty years. It's act, but it's actually and you were you were still in uniform as well. You remember this. The, uh, in 1992, the Navy and the Marine Corps leadership, civilian and, and uniformed, issued something uh, called "From the Sea," it's a, which was our first effort at uh, post-Cold War uh, strategy making. If you read the preamble that, to that, and I urge everybody to do it, it's out there on the internet. That's, but it, it, de it declares, and I'm, I'm only overstating this a little bit. It, it declares that history is over. Naval history is over. Our primary mission, which is to fight for and, and, and win command of the sea against peer adversaries is gone. It declares that, that that is gone and that Western nations essentially rule the sea more or less permanently. Soviet Navy's uh, sitting uh, sitting rusting at its uh, moorings. Uh, there's no there's no enemy in view and it more or less says there's not one coming. Man, I tell you what, and, and, it, and it instructs the services, the, the Navy and the Marines to transform themselves. And this is a, a literal quote into a fundamentally diff different naval service that assumes it owns the sea and can, and can project power from that sea uh, but simply because it's a safe haven. I mean, they I mean, and that's a really powerful signal to send to the force. I mean, the uh, I mean, if somebody you know how it is, if somebody with four star who wears four stars or is a secretary of the navy tells you to do something, you say okay. Well, if we don't need to practice anti-surface warfare, anti-air -air warfare, anti-submarine warfare that much, well, you're going to let those uh, skills atrophy. You're going to stop. You're going to lose your game as far as keeping uh, developing new technology and so forth. I mean, just one small example that goes back to to my to my experience in the Navy. We're, I mean, we're scrambling to reconstitute a long-range anti-ship capability right now. Well, you know what? We had one 30 years ago in the form of the anti in in, in the form of the uh, anti-ship Tomahawk variant, a, a variant with hundreds of miles of range. Now we're trying to now we're trying to surge those uh, similar capabilities out there. So. I'll tell you what, uh, if you if you tell yourself that that history is ended and that, and that your primary mission is no more, it is really hard to stand back up. And I think we're dealing with the hangover from uh, from 30, 30 some years ago, simply because simply because it takes a long time to uh, turn a battleship, turn a, turn an aircraft carrier. Pick your favorite uh, maritime metaphor for trying to uh, trying to transform a big a big big institution. Even if yeah. you're the CNO, you don't just get, get get to order the institution to do something, and and you really have to bear down and for several years and, and make it happen through your own personal energy and attention. All right. So we had the the post Cold War peace dividend, and which saw the Navy go from nearly 600 ships to now it's now under 
under 300 ships, right? And dropping. Uh, we had the, you know, from the sea, which which turned the Navy essentially into a power projection Navy where we don't have to worry, as you said, about sea control. We could assume sea control, go anywhere we need to, to go and project power using Tomahawk land attack missiles, using, you know, Navy SEALs, using, um, you know, carrier based aircraft, F-18s, et cetera, you know, dropping bombs. Um, but we didn't have to worry about a uh, an adversary at sea contesting sea control, and and now we do, right? And and I think this is where the NAV plan points out China is that adversary. Twenty twenty seven is the the the, uh, the framing timeline for this plan, uh, which is a really short timeline in a in something yes. as big as uh, as the U.S. Navy to turn itself. Um, and sea control is is certainly not a given. Um, but we'll have to fight, start with sea, sea denial. And I'm, I also was noting that although she didn't specifically call it this, but Admiral Paparo has been calling the, the capabilities that could make the Taiwan Strait a hellscape, right? Yeah, is, that's, that's a sea cool. denial, right? That's a sea denial, um, you know, essentially like we won't own it, but for China to try to cross the Taiwan Strait with its forces, uh, it's going to be it's going to be a hellscape, right? So, um, talk a little bit about what your thoughts are on that. The you know essentially we're two years and three months or so from uh, from 2027. Talk about the you know that timing and about um, you know what you're hearing up at the Naval War College in terms of um, change in emphasis, uh, sense of urgency. You know what's going on there to get to get to as uh, you know, CNO Franchetti basically said, I want the U.S. Navy to be more ready for war in 27 than the Chinese Navy is. Uh, yeah, I mean to take you take your second uh, your, your second uh, question first the, as far as what's going on here at the college. I mean the, the I mean it's a little it's a, the the answer is a little bit more complicated than you might think. I mean certainly our student body these are uh, uh, by and large uh, active duty officers or or or. or uh, Representatives of the State Department and other uh, federal agencies. I mean, so so they so they will take it very seriously simply because this is guidance from on high, and and, and that would be true of the military faculty as well. It would also be true of the of the of the civilian faculty who does maritime stuff on a day day to day basis because that's they do research on it, they do war gaming or whatever the case may be. I mean, it would also be uh, true for people such as myself who do it as my own personal research and writing. But I mean, keep, keep in mind keep keep in mind that a lot of the civilian faculty on the in the academic side, on the teaching side, were not recruited to do Navy and maritime stuff. They were recruited for insurgency, counterinsurgency, for general regional expert uh, regional expertise, and so forth. So I think I think the, I think the and, this, and by the way, I mean no disrespect at all. I love I love my my colleagues, and this is a great place to work. But the fact is that there's there's simply that's simply not what they specialize in. And I think that it's possible that the the message might not be amplified uh, through some of the faculty simply because it's not what they what they do from a, on a day to day basis. So it's a so I, but the the institution we've been, we we now we now uh, we, we were directed some years ago to uh, to start focusing on China, uh, especially under the tenure of uh, Secretary of Defense James Mattis. Uh, there was a, so there was a lot of a lot of emphasis uh, put on that at that point, and and that, and that continues. Uh, well, I mean, it's it's pretty, it's pretty much uh, around us all, all 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 day, every day. China comes up in every seminar, even if you're talking about the Peloponnesian War or World War One, or you know, pick your favorite historical case that we cover in our in our department. And the students, so it's really on the students' mind, and it's really on most of the faculty's minds as well. As far as what we do, I mean, a two a two years, a, man, I tell you what, it's it's kind of interesting. The I I would just a Clausewitz defines military strength. As a as a product of multiplying uh, uh, force and will, so your sort of your material material capability and your willpower to use that capability to accomplish your goals, I, I would actually take that a little bit farther and you just riff on that. I would define military strength as a, as a compound of not only a power of force but also resolve, skill, and a line or, or morale. Three of those things are human in nature, and three of those and those things are, that are particularly susceptible to quick change by CNO because. She controls recruitment. She controls training. She sets policy on promotions and assignments. And I mean, these are things that she can use to affect those human components of uh, of sea power. She also has a huge bully pulpit. Uh, should she uh, choose to use it early and often, and, and I think she will. And I think she will. So those seem like the things that are that are most susceptible to to uh, change with it with it with, with within two 
two years plus a little bit. That's how you that's how you bring about that paradigm shift is by changing minds and hearts within the uh, certainly on the active on the active duty side, but also among us uh, civilians as well. So those, I think those are the, probably be the easiest things uh, the easiest things to change in short order. The power factor. I mean, that's a lot harder just because we live in an industrial age. I mean, it's it's. I, I think we're. I mean, we're trying to figure out what material we need to accomplish our mission and to procure an insufficient bulk to actually prevail if we get in a fight with the Chinese or or whoever. Our mission, as you pointed out, I mean, it's it's our, our basic mission is a sea denial mission. We need to halt a Chinese amphibious fleet before it can cross the Taiwan Strait, or potentially we need to to to, to deny China, uh, China control of the East China Sea so it can't take back the Senkaku Islands from Japan or the South China Sea so that it can not essentially make that into a Chinese lake, as it is repeatedly said it wants to, it wants to do. Uh, but we're, we're, we're basically going to go to war with the Navy that we have right now, just because you can't change the platform side all that much. Uh, I mean, if, I mean, especially when your ship, the only plans, uh, plans are all, 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 all at least a year, behind, or more like three years in the case of the Constellation Class Frig. I mean, all of our programs are, are simply behind. So on the platform side, we're sort of stuck. Uh, which means I think we have to, to concentrate on the payload on the payload side, stocking that stocking that fleet up with munitions in abundance, looking for lower cost munitions such as uh, lower cost uh, anti ship missiles and so forth, equipping itself to defend itself with novel technologies like uh, directed energy and improved uh, electronic warfare, uh, procuring drones that make the street that hellscape. I mean, these are all things that we can that we can affect within a couple within a couple of years. It's not going to be easy because a lot of that's industrial in nature, building up the production capacity for long-range anti-ship missiles or, or pick your favorite munition but uh but, uh, but those are things i think we can actually that we can actually affect we also also I, the i should also put it in a word for the for the unses, uh, unsexy aspects of maritime strategy the state of our logistics fleet is a calamity and now we're and now we're talking about idling 17 uh, 17 logistics vessels because we don't have enough civilian mariners to crew them we will not prevail in, in the western pacific with it without the without those assets and a whole lot more than them if I were if I if I were commanding the the People's Liberation Army, heaven forbid that that would be my prime target would be the logistics force. Take that away, and the fleet goes away as well because it doesn't ha it doesn't have uh, arms, it doesn't have fuel. It's a, at best it can put it into port and, and, and restock there, but uh, but even that's going to be uh, uh, dicey simply simply because of Chinese uh, ballistic missile strikes on on our allies. Jim, as the Navy uh, leaned itself out and went from six hundred to under three hundred ships. It certainly leaned out the logistics force, right? And so, because you don't, you know, we didn't have to, you know, control or or contest control of the seas. The navy could go where it needed to go in the '90s and the 2000s. You don't need a a, a big logistics force. Uh, you you know, it, you can go where you need to go, and your logistics force can operate uh, around the world as you know, sort of like um, uh, it, it was a lean six sigma kind of revolution in naval logistics which is great until you until you have to have contested logistics right and as yeah, soon you as can't you can't have a you can't efficiency can't, can't cannot be it cannot be your top priority in strategic competition and warfare i mean you, you simply can't you simply can't ha have a lean force that you, you have to have a surplus i mean you have to have yeah you we're going to take losses we're going to we're going to have maintenance problems and so forth i mean you have to have a surplus i know congress doesn't like that and for obvious reasons just because of, because they're the money people but i but but, but you know what we're, we're setting ourselves up for faith i mean just look at look at what happened just this week with the with the grounding of one of our one of our logistics ships the big horn the the, the, the logist the one logistics ship supply in the abraham lincoln uh, carrier group in the red sea now the logistics for that force is is now very much in uh, in question because there's I, I think there's one or two other smaller ships, but their their fuel capacity is 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 not nearly what the Big Horn carried, and it's and that's going to be yeah. So I'm not sure what's going to happen there, but that's certainly a lesson our Chinese and Russian friends will take away from that is hit the logistics fleet and then the rest of the fleet in, is in dire trouble. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, it's a it's a new strategy navigation plan from uh, Admiral Lisa Franchetti. It's out about ten days ago. Uh, Jim Holmes has been my guest today, a Naval War College professor, the J.C. Wiley Chair of Maritime Strategy uh, at the Naval War College, and one of my favorite proceedings authors because, Jim, you're always good at, at taking complex topics and ex explaining them in ways that Ensign Hamlet or Lieutenant Hamlet would have really appreciated. Uh, you know, uh, And I can always go to you when something's breaking. I can always say, hey, Jim, can you give us a thousand words on this? And you always come back with something very quick. So uh, much appreciated your analysis on uh, 
on the new nav plan. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. I mean, and by the, I would just something you just said. I would just expand on that. Uh, what we do is really not that complicated. I mean, it, it, as far as strategic concepts, I mean, it, these it, we we. Tr we tend to make it into some, some something really arcane and esoteric and so forth. Then, if we if we speak if we speak to one another and also to key audiences like the American people in Congress in plain language about what strategy is, it's about being stronger at the at the right time in the right place to in order to defeat your adversary. Isn't that really what it's all about? I mean, that's what operational art is all about at at, at, at its most basic. If you speak in those terms, you can go you can accomplish a lot. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, well, we're out of time. My guest has been Jim Holmes, Professor of Maritime Strategy at the Naval War College. His article, The Navy's New Nav Plan, sets its sights on China from a sea denial stance, is in the September Proceedings online. You go to usni.org, click on the Proceedings tab, and it's one of the top articles. Uh, Jim, as always, great to talk to you. Uh, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks, Bill. Always a pleasure. All right. This episode was brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers. Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. And don't forget, on 17 October, the Naval Institute and the Naval Academy will be co-hosting our annual fall conference. This one is focused on energy security, infrastructure, and the defense industrial base. Pulitzer Prize winning author Daniel Jurgen, an expert on energy, will be our morning keynote speaker. And Secretary of the Navy Carlos del Toro will be our afternoon keynote speaker. You can attend in person at the Naval Institute's Jack C. Taylor Conference Center or virtually. Just go to usni.org forward slash events to register. Hope to see you on the 17th. And until then, Remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.